A long, long time ago I can scarce remember Why I came down to this crazy place The astral world was fine with me Beauty as far as I could see But time came to rejoin the human race so I found a body I could enter, picked one near an Ananda center. The master is my guru, now I'm stuck down here with all you. I still remember how I cried, that I couldn't stay up there and hide. But something touched me deep inside The day my ego died <laughs> So bye-bye through the spiritual eye Try to enter through the center Kiss your ego goodbye them good old yogis drinking latte and chai Singing this'll be the day the eye dies This'll be the day the eye dies Have you read the book of Brigo And do you have faith in your true guru When your heart just tells you so have trust in God above Can you win his perfect love And can your restless mind go real slow Well, I know we're all his girls and boys Cause I saw us playing with his toys We all fall for his play Even though we know we'll pay I was a lonely soul lost here on earth Till I felt my soul's rebirth and learned about my own true worth the day my ego died. I started singing bye-bye through the spiritual light. Try to enter through the center, kiss your ego goodbye. Them good old yogis drinking latte and chai, singing this'll be the day the eye dies. This'll be the day the eye dies. Now for many years I was doing Kriya, hoping my ego would just say, See ya. But it just sat there like a stone. But penetrating the dark of night, in a sudden flash of light, Divine Mother's sweet voice thrilled my bones. Oh, and while the gurus were looking down, a smile came from beneath my frown. The game finished its turn, no karma left to burn. And the three men who mean most to me, Master Christ and Baba G, helped me get back home to be the day my ego died. Sing along. Cause they were calling bye-bye through the spiritual life Try to enter through the center, kiss your ego goodbye Them good old yogis drinking latte and shy Singing this'll be the day the eye dies This'll be the day the eye dies Cause they were calling bye-bye through the spiritual life Try to enter through the center, kiss your ego goodbye. And good old yogis drinking latte and chai, singing this'll be the day the eye dies. You know that this'll be the day the eye dies.
who may not know us. My name is Nayaswami Daiva, and this is Nayaswami Gangamata. And it seems a little odd that I'm giving the uh, service on love instead of her. <laughs> but here we are. Devotion doesn't come necessarily easy to everyone. Many of us, um, our first yoga, our first response to life is action or intellect. And to f feel that the heart has to be somehow engaged in this um, relationship with finding fulfillment seems just like a dirty trick. But it is, through all times, the center of everything of meaning. And especially in this age, uh, our masters spoke of the fact that action is important. We have to learn how to use action. We, we're teaching a course in Raja Yoga right now, the art and science of Raja Yoga. And we're just in the process of talking about the different yogas, the different ways that our souls connect back to spirit. And there are those of us who, our first response, you can tell your primary yoga because um, if somebody asks you a question or if life presents you with a circumstance, what is your first response? Some people, they just want to get up and do something. Some people, They'll say, oh, I don't know how I, I don't know what to think about that. And other people say, gosh, I'm not sure how I feel. And those are, the, those are the primary pathways through which we engage in life and that we use as a filter. Every one of us um, has to be engaged in life and to, to understand the yoga of action. Um, in, in India, they call it Nishkam Karma. It's the... Uh, it's um, action without the desire for the fruits of action. Uh, we have to learn to act without wanting something for ourselves. Because every time we want something for ourselves, whether it's praise, or respect, or money, or any other kind of thing, we reinforce the I that the first song was trying to get rid of. We're talking about bye-bye. <laughs> through the spiritual eye, that, that, that sense of ourselves is the problem, that sense that this, it's actually not that sense of ourselves, it's the limited sense of ourselves, the sense that this, this personality, this body, this little life is who we are, instead of experiencing ourselves and knowing ourselves to be one with spirit, which is what Christ and all the masters are trying to remind us of and help us to awaken to. They said of wisdom, and for those of us who have, have active and engaging intellects, um, and there are probably many of us in here, um, 
just real quickly, Sri Yukteswar dispensed on uh, jnana or wisdom yoga as being the appropriate uh, approach to the divine in this age. He says, it's not the age for that. Mankind can't even get past the delusion that they need food in order to live. Think about that. Food is a delusion. The need for food for survival. And, you know, we can all experience little tastes of that through fasting and that kind of thing, or running and going past our limitation and hitting that, that super conscious flow. But um, wisdom yoga would have us identify ourselves. You would say, not this, not that. Am I a man? Am I a woman? Am I this age? Am I a mother? Am I, a, a, you know, a, a doctor, a lawyer, a failure, or whatever? And, of course, the answer is no to all of that. You know, I'm, I'm not even a yogi. I'm not a uh, environmentalist. I'm not any of those things. I'm not a Monsanto employee. None of this stuff. We are something that is so far beyond any limitation. And that, again, is the invitation of spirit, is for us to experience ourselves. In that, expanded reality is all the joy and all the love and all the freedom we're seeking. They said of devotion. They said of devotion, that devotion, cultivating devotion, in this age, it's like having this enormous pack of uh, weight, of karma, of things that you're trudging along through your life with. Self-identities and resentments and hopes and aspirations just stuck in this pack and you're trudging along. And gradually, with devotion, what happens is you're walking along and one day you realize the pack is just empty. The pack is just empty. And that all the freedom, everything you've sought is there. <clears throat> There's, uh, the scriptures are wonderful. Um, we tell the story of the, of the Mahabharata and the Bhagavad Gita uh, is a small chapter that's in there. It's the Hindu Bible. It's the center of the reading we had on Krishna's voice today. But it's the story of what happens inside and it's both metaphorical inwardly for what happens and how we grow, but also outwardly. There's a, there's a figure in the story and she's the most beautiful and magnanimous and glorious woman ever born. Her name is Drupadi. She's fireborn. And she ends up marrying all five of the heroes of our story. It's very peculiar. And uh, they are the enemies of, of the Kurus. This is the Pandava line. It's um, the five brothers, and they are nobility and vitality and self-control and proper behavior. They are great. They're all the things that reinforce us. And she represents the Kundalini power. She represents the energy that has to pass up through the center anatomically. It's a, it's a yogic treatise. But there's a scene in there where um, there's been a great game of dice where spirituality has gambled with material desire. And guess what? It lost. And it lost not only the kingdoms that it was ruling, but it lost everything, including its own, its own possession of itself. And so there they are in the story. Um, they're in the kingdom, in this beautiful palace, in, in the royal halls. The gambling is over, and all of the great uh, warriors are there, and the winner, material desire, has won. And he is going to drive spirituality out of the kingdom. And he says, you know, you are now my slaves. You don't even possess yourselves. And he says, even the clothes that you wear are no longer yours. And so these great and noble warrior, um, the good qualities, they just take off all their clothes and they just lay them aside and they're just standing there. At least they have their dignity. And then he says, even your wife is not your own. And um, he says to one of his brothers, Duryodhana says to one of his brothers, he says, go and fetch Drapati from the women's chambers. And he goes and he drags her by the hair. He drags her into the presence of all of this energy that's going on, and it's, it's just not done to a highborn uh, woman or a highborn princess. This is degrading beyond measure, and the five warrior brothers are standing and they're fuming, but they, they're holding themselves in, they're behaving, and Duryodhana says, your brothers, your husbands are no longer worthy of you, and I free you now. You may choose from any of these other great warriors uh, your new husband, and then he slaps his thigh, and the brothers are over there seething, and they're about ready to break free into, into instant warfare right there in front of everybody. But they hold themselves. And he says, in fact, even your clothing doesn't belong to you. And he calls on his, on his 
brother who dragged her in there, he says, take off her sari. And this is, this is a dharma, this is bad beyond measure. And Draupadi looks at her husbands and they're just, they're not going to do anything. They are holding themselves back because of the error that they've made and they're not going to come to their def her defense. She looks at all of the great, so, um, the great leaders of the Kuru family and not a one of them, not the grandfather, nobody's going to come to her defense. And she realizes that all human aid is lost to her. And she falls on her knees at that moment. And she prays to God in the form that is her guru, Krishna. And she just prays and she just loses herself to this world. And Dusasana, the bad guy, walks over and he starts to t unwrap her sari. Now a sari is six yards of fabric. And he starts to take and unwind the fabric off of her and she is completely lost. All she is doing is just praying to God. And he unwinds and he unwinds and he unwinds and he unwinds and he's gone through six yards and eight yards and ten yards and twelve yards and he continues to pull and pull and pull and still she is fully clothed. And he, he pulls so long that finally he's exhausted and still, and there's this huge pile of cloth and there she is still just lost and completely clothed. And they begin to realize just how terrible what they've done is and that there is more going on, that there's more protection and more in the story than they could have possibly imagined. And that story is in there. And then, of course, what happens is they apologize and they try and make it all up and, and the story goes on. But that story is in there. That story is in there because of the topic today. That we find our security in the presence of divine love. That at the end of the day, when all human aid is lost to us, when we can find nothing outward that works, when our bodies have betrayed us, our friends have betrayed us, our circumstances didn't measure up to what we yearned for, that every single thing that we sought is gone. We're not available to prop us up anymore. That in turning finally back to the divine where it's always been, we find all of our security. We find all of the gift and blessings that we'd ever sought. I remember a few years after coming to Ananda, and I came hungry. I came yearning. And I took on the disciplines, I took on the, the gifts that these masters brought to help us have contact with God. I knew I wanted something, I didn't know what it was, and I'd always been a little standoffish of religion, because it was always presented in kind of a, you just simply have to believe. And I was a scientist, it was the need to experience, the need for something to be provable was essential in my nature. But the, the master said, I don't ask you to believe anything I say, I ask you to practice these things long enough to prove to yourself whether what I say is true or not. So I did. And I, and I found that if I, as far as I had the courage to practice Hongsa, hong energization, Om and Kriya with self-offering, that invariably what they promised showed up, happened in my life. And change happened deeply in ways I could never have imagined, in ways that I didn't even, wasn't even aware of. And one day, I was just three or four years into this, I was just talking with some friends. I, I had put myself in the environment. I, I dissolved myself into it. I didn't want to do it part-time recreationally. And I was talking with some friends about the presence of God, the presence of this unseen influence, this unseen connection to life. And I, in the midst of this conversation, I had a very peculiar experience. And I don't, it's not wise to talk about your spiritual experiences unless you feel an inward um, endorsement. So I don't speak of this, I don't speak of these things lightly nor frequently, but I feel like it's important. I felt all of a sudden, in the midst of this conversation, nothing changed, but I felt myself all of a sudden aware of this golden radiance that enveloped all around me. And I would guess it was, you know, if I had to give it a physical dimension, it was an arm's length or more. But it was iridescent, it was radiant, it was scintillating. And then all of a sudden, it just, I became aware of it. It was just all of a sudden, there it was. It wasn't like it had come. It was, it was like it was there already. I was just being able to perceive it. All of a sudden, it, like it, a zipper just unzipped 
down one side, <laughs> and I was struggling. And the thing just went like this, an accordion back, and then disappeared. And I felt myself naked. I felt myself exposed. I felt myself vulnerable to every, every whim of fate, every movement of other people's influence of life at every level. A, a vulnerability I don't know how to describe, except it was horrifying. And then simply came back up, came back around, sealed, and vanished. And I realized that's the security, that's the gift of spirit. That we become enveloped in a protective cocoon of care and love. And I realized that what I would experience when it was gone was what I had been living in before the path. And that that love, that, that, that wholeness is there but as Yogananda said, these four teachings, they are the disciplines that draw God's grace. It's in the practice of Hong Sa and energization and Om technique and Kriya and service and devotion that we find ourselves enveloped in that light without even knowing it. And all of a sudden our lives become magically, unimaginably blessed and uplifted and touched. We still have all the challenges. I, I love the fact that security and love are put together. If you come to Ananda, if you spend any time, if you're serious on the path, I don't care what your environment, God will bring to you the things that you need to learn so that you can continue to grow. And I love how he, he puts um, into juxtaposition people with control issues and people with authority issues. <laughs> it's a perfect match. <laughs> don't do that. How dare you talk to me? <laughs> until we discover that there's something beyond the roles that are being played out, that love is what, where, where things heal, love is where they reconcile, and that we have to soften away from our particular stance and our particular quirks. I don't care whether they were because of your mother or your grandmother or your uncle didn't treat you well or it was 17 lifetimes ago when you were a slave. It just doesn't matter where it comes from. We have to outgrow those tendencies. And the way to do it is in the softness of kindness and love in the willingness to let go of our own self-definition and all the things that are offered us, our, our opportunities for service, our chances for everything are, are just gifts to help us get outside the box of self-identity and self-definition. I'm going to read this. Usually we read from Whispers from Eternity and I have about five readings there that I picked out for today and then a reading from this book. But we're going to end early because there is a blessing, a land blessing for a Yogananda um, Parmansi Yogananda of the Northwest Gardens out at Ananda Laurelwood. And the auspicious time is 1220. And we've been asked to officiate, and you are all, all invited to come out there for the blessing. It will be lovely, it will be brief and beautiful, and it is a stunning setting. And we would love to have your blessings. If you can come physically, great. If not, please send your prayers. But uh, we won't drag the, the service on today because of that. This is Yogananda writing about love, you know, we have to be careful not to become attached in our love. As we soften our hearts, pull away from the affirmation and commitment of our littleness, whether it's, whether it's you know, self-protective as uh, authority issues or control issues, we start to fall in love with everybody we meet. And then we start to become very vulnerable. And he writes, None I behold as stranger. I rejoice to love all with the God-given pure feeling of human attachment. Think about this. This is so backward from how most yogis present love. I care not how many holy men howl be attached to no one. I am attached to everyone. Non-attachment is necessary if one's love encompasses only one or a few, excluding all others. Never could my attachment be exclusive, omitting any from my circle of love. To love all with genuine, genuine attachment as one's own is beautiful, enjoyable, heart-thrilling, and heart-awakening. It is he, the cosmic lover, as the cosmic trickster, who comes to us garbed in the forms of those we love, father, mother, child, beloved, friend, acquaintance, in teaching us to give love through parental, conjugal, and friendly attachments, the cosmic lover surreptitiously imbibes from us in those forms. 
the attachment fragrant love of our hearts, even as he gives attachment perfumed love to us in the guise of parent, child, beloved, and friend. Why then does he cruelly break our hearts with his game of hide and seek, making us love some of his forms as our own beloved ones, and then causing them to vanish silently behind the impenetrable screen of dissolution? He thinks we take his entertainments amiss. He doesn't wish to hurt us with pangs of separation. He wants us to love him, not flesh bound in one or two infinite bo finite bodies, but with an all embracing attachment to his infinitely diverse forms in all incarnations and ages. He seeks our steadfast love pure, spiritual, wholehearted, with perfect abandonment as he displays his entertaining new forms on the stage of life. Let us not be afraid to love our dear ones, foolishly fearing to lose them in the mists of death. Love them so dearly, so truly, so purely, and forever unlamentingly, even in temporary love kindling separation, that you find in them the everlasting true love of God. Finding divine love, you will find beneath its canopy all your loved ones of all incarnations. And with omnipresent love, you will embrace not only them, but all heretofore unseen, unknown forms of the cosmic lover. Moment of silence and we'll have some music.